Look to the skies and you will feel it. A deep, universal fascination with flight. A fascination with birds. There are legions of bird watchers all across the world. But for some, watching is not enough. In the sport of falconry, man and bird hunt together. It pushes your adrenaline like nothing else on earth. You've only got to watch it to realize it's the most emotional sport there is. Birds are creatures of many meanings. In India, they are a sign of hope, messengers from heaven. When the birds come, we have a good harvest. If the birds don't come, there is trouble. Birds are also killers. But these skills can help defend our farms. What do burn owls like to eat? Does anybody know? Rats. Rats, bulls, and rodents. That's right. Birds have a long history of service to mankind. But sometimes, it's their friendship that matters most. They say parrots pick their friends. Angel just loves Sister Yuna. They're not little humans. They're very intelligent, they're very sensitive, they communicate with body language. We really like to let people see these beautiful creatures doing the things that they would normally do in the wild. Don't you want to fly away like a bird? <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Imagine being dressed in a rainbow of feathers. They may be scarlet or pale pink, richly patterned or solid white. Some are clever camouflage, while the sole purpose of others is to attract attention. Whatever their color or design, feathers are what turn the ugly duckling into something extraordinary. Feathers are just the beginning of our fascination with birds. For these dazzling creatures also sing and dance. But birds have one talent we envy above all others. In the blink of an eye, they can lift into the air and fly. Each kind of bird uses the power of flight for its own purpose. Arctic terns are record travelers, crossing the entire planet twice in a single year. Flamingos seek out terrible places, converging on poisonous lakes to raise their chicks where almost nothing else can survive. Quilias, the most numerous birds on Earth, flock for protection, swirling across the African sky like a school of fish. Amazed by their mysterious abilities, we have studied birds with more zeal and dedication than we have any other creatures. And in learning how they feed, mate, and nest, we have also discovered that there is more to birds than the mere facts and figures of their lives. There are even places where their comings and goings can mean the difference between prosperity and suffering. In South India, it's the painful height of the dry season. In the small town of Kundakulam, the time has come for birds to bring rain. Cattle, crops, the livelihood of the village depends on it. But this year, there has been no rain. The great flocks haven't come to the village, and Kundakulam is facing its worst enemy drought. Last year, there were many colorful birds that looked like flowers on a tree. But this year, I don't see any birds on the trees. Usually, before January, they'll start circling, and when the people of the village see them, they know it's time for the seeds to be sown, and they know they'll have a good harvest. If the birds come, we know we will be prosperous. If they don't come, 
there will be trouble. The elders say that as gospel truth, and we follow that. But Kundakulam is a town of faith. Here, children are taught early about what birds mean to their village. They are told of how generations ago, when the farmers were desperate for rain, the birds answered their prayers. Even now, at the village shrine, people are praying asking the gods to have mercy, to send help. The prayers rise up into the empty skies. A month overdue, the birds arrive, riding the winds of the monsoon. Pelicans, storks, ibis, flamingos. The air is filled with thousands of wings, all converging on Kundakulam. Once again, the birds have brought the rains to Kundakulam. And after three weeks of persistent downpour, the village is transformed. The birds and the monsoon are ancient partners in the seasons of southern India. The birds herald the coming of the rains because the flooding landscape makes Kundakulam a perfect place to nest. What they need most is suddenly plentiful. Nest sites perched high and dry, just above food-rich waters. Even good building materials are easy for a pelican to come by. In some uncanny way, the birds are able to anticipate the timing and direction of the rains each year. If they do not keep their appointment with the village, it signals that the monsoon has changed its course. The children head for a replenished lake to witness the spectacle of the great flocks. In a good year, some 10,000 birds will nest in and around Kundakulam. Welcoming them is a village tradition and an important lesson for the children. For life is still lived close to the land here, and all things are timed to the seasons. Villagers can now plant rice, coconuts, bananas, sugar, with every hope of a good harvest. In the wake of the plow, egrets feast on exposed worms and insects, the farmer's gift back to the birds.
With such a wealth of water, it's easy to share. But in this newly made water world, Kunda Kulam achieves something more. Here, people and flocks of completely wild birds reach a strange and special communion. No one disturbs the feeding and nesting birds. For eight weeks, this remote farming community in South India opens its doors to thousands of feathered guests. As the nesting season comes to a close, all is well again in the village of Kunda Kulam. A world that faced drought and famine has been restored. The birds of the monsoon are ambassadors of weather that can save or destroy. Their coming always brings a change in the wind, an answer to a prayer. The falcon answers a different longing, but one just as primal. They are warriors, fierce and fast. Above all else, they are hunters, putting their speed and skill to a timeless test of survival. Roger Upton practices the ancient art of falconry. By training and flying such a bird, he comes as close to being a falcon as a human can ever hope to get. Okay. No bird of prey is ever truly tame, and that too is part of its magic. We don't teach it to fly, it flies. We don't teach it to kill, it kills. All we teach it to do is to accept us as a hunting companion. To the falconer, the peregrine is the ultimate in perfection. Its long bird-killing feet are armed with rapier talons. Its legs are shock absorbers to withstand the tremendous power of its own strike. Its enormous dark eyes have a telephoto retina capable of magnifying the center of its field of vision. But its real power comes from its long, strong wings. Wing muscles make up a third of its weight. And in the air, the peregrine truly becomes the high-speed, jet-powered Ferrari of Falcons. Its dive, or stoop, has been clocked at an extraordinary 200 miles per hour. With all this talent, Falcons are demanding and temperamental partners. Their company has always been reserved for the lucky few. Hunting with falcons began before history. From the steppes of Asia to the dunes of Arabia, kings and their nobles rode out to the hunt with falcons on their wrists. It was sport and power and privilege, with the training of birds passed down from master to apprentice like sacred rites. Here on the unchanging moors of Scotland, the ancient ways live on. Roger Upton, master falconer, has a pupil, his son Mark. Each year, father and son spend six weeks here in Scotland training and flying their birds. I can remember at the age of four or five, sort of tiny, trailing along in my father's footsteps across the heather, which was up to my waist in those days. But even then, being very interested in watching the flights. The Uptons practice the most complex form of falconry, 
grouse hawking. Man, bird, and dog must work in perfect synchrony. Mark places the falcons on a catch, a frame for carrying them in the field. All the falcons are hooded, which keeps them calm and quiet. Up ahead of the party, English pointers fan out in excitement, working the heather. Suddenly, they have it, the scent of grouse. With the dogs on point, Mark brings his favorite peregrine, Oliver Twist, to his wrist. The hood comes off and he is free to fly. Knowing his business, Oliver heads straight for where the dogs are on point. Then he begins to climb, ringing as it's called, to his pitch a position high above the dogs. Hey, hey, hey. The best peregrines can hunt from more than a thousand feet up. The dogs advance to flush the grouse. Now it's up to Oliver. This time, just barely, the grouse wins the day. But to encourage his desire to hunt, Oliver is still rewarded with fresh meat. And for Roger Upton, it's the thrill of the chase rather than the kill that's important. Today's fights were mixed. We didn't have what I'd call a classic today. You don't get spectacular every day. I've seen many great fights which haven't necessarily ended in a kill. It makes you realize how good the successes are. A falcon can take us high and fast, but not even a peregrine can match the extraordinary flight of a hummingbird. Only a hummingbird can truly hover in still air. Its thin, stiff wings simply rotate at the shoulder, creating lift not by their shape and contour, but by their motion. The Hummingbird is the helicopter to the Peregrine's F-16. This virtuosity in the air, and almost everything else about hummingbirds, is due to the fact that they live on nectar. Their flying skills allow them to feed in mid-air, directly in front of delicately waving blossoms. In return for their food, the birds pollinate the plants. Some hummingbirds' bills are a perfect match for the shape of their favorite flower. The sickle build's strangely curved beak is designed to feed only on the curved flowers of the heliconia. The datura plant is another exclusive partner. Its enormous six to eight inch flowers are too deep for all hummingbirds except one. The sword build. The sword build is the only bird whose beak is actually longer than its body. Hummingbirds that aren't equipped with special beaks are often adorned with dazzling colors. the sapphire-fronted emerald, the tourmaline sun angel, the ruby topaz. Their names alone attest to their jewel-like radiance. The secret is in the structure of their feathers. 
Microscopic prisms inside each feather split, refract, and reflect different wavelengths. The feathers appear lit from within, as though hummingbirds were made of light. These flashes of brilliance are all about protecting their patch of flowers. Hummingbirds use them to signal ownership of prized territories, taking on rivals in a clash of color. But perhaps the most extraordinary thing about hummingbirds is the most obvious, their size. They are masters of miniaturization. And in their case, smaller also means faster. An average-sized hummer must beat its wings 25 times a second in order to produce the lift it needs to stay in the air. But in the tiny bee hummingbird, scarcely two inches long, that accelerates to an astonishing 200 beats a second. All this requires a great deal of fuel. Flower nectar is high octane, but even so, the smallest hummingbirds have to feed every three to five minutes. Then, they add the stress of mating, raising chicks, and a grueling annual migration. Hummingbirds accomplish all this with one more metabolic miracle. At night, their hearts can slow to a fraction of their normal rates, and they can drop their body temperature in half, from 110 to 55 degrees. They live at half speed in a torpor deeper than sleep. In flower fields high in New Mexico, Dr. William Calder of the University of Arizona is trying to find out just how hummingbirds do it. My basic interest is the consequences and opportunities posed by body size. And part of the story is looking at the extremes. The smallest tell us more than something in the middle. Calder's specialty is the rufous hummingbird. Using a mist net, he and his wife, Loreen, intercept them on their journey south from Canada. Another thing is to look at the body mass. The weight tells you basically how much fuel they've got. Each time they stop, they have burned all their fat and they have burned part of the protein, so their weight is way down. They're very close to almost burning out, starving to death. Apparently, hummingbirds operate with no margin of error. But what may look like starvation may actually be normal for their extraordinary metabolisms. They have evolved into more than 300 species. The rufus takes success one step further. It's the champion of hummingbird migration. From their breeding grounds as far north as coastal Alaska, the birds head south down the Rockies to the mountains of Mexico to winter. Come spring, they take a western route north, flying up through California to their summer grounds in southwestern Canada and beyond. This tiny bird travels farther for its body size than any other creature on Earth. Round trip, it's more than 5,000 miles. Yet they navigate with such accuracy that the same birds are caught in the same field year after year. How is it possible? That information they are storing in, in a brain that's about the size of Abe Lincoln's head on a penny. And yet they are coming back precisely to the same filling station along the way, uh, doing as well as this very nice, portable, small, miniaturized uh, GPS system that takes fixes off of five, six or so satellites and gets an exact position. We got birds with this little brain that are coming and doing the same thing, and they don't have a GPS. They couldn't begin to carry off a whole herd of them couldn't carry this one machine. So. Rufus male, adult. And there's a couple of red feathers there, and one right over there, way off the side. 
Remarkably, juvenile birds travel on their own. They do not learn the route from their parents, and their track south is very different than the path they will take north next spring. This means that much of what they do must be genetically programmed. Yet hummingbirds show surprising flexibility. They will delay their trip if flowers are late to bloom, and they will adjust their path and altitude to take advantage of yearly variations in their food supply. How they anticipate these changes, no one knows. Calder is turning to technology for some answers. By extracting a few feathers, he obtains a minute amount of tissue. Using new developments in DNA sequencing, he will look for the keys to their amazing behavior in their genetic instructions. So much of their biology is totally unknown. There's just a whole world out there left to discover. It's pretty awe-inspiring. It's extraordinary that a creature so small could keep so many secrets. But our next characters are famous for relaying our secrets. Pigeons. On first sight, they are ordinary, everyday birds. You may toss them a crumb, then pass them by, never suspecting these common street birds capable of greater glory. But in the annals of avian history, no bird can rival the pigeon for courage under fire, devotion to duty, and service to humanity. All common pigeons have the ability to home, and in the great conflicts of the 20th century, homing pigeons became full-fledged war heroes. Thousands of homers campaigned in World Wars I and II. They advanced across Europe, North Africa, and Asia, an air force of messengers braving heavy artillery to file their reports. By the fortunes of war, a few achieved greatness. The foremost of these was G.I. Joe. It was 1943. The British 56th Infantry Division had met the Germans at a heavily fortified Italian village. They requested air support. On the morning of October 18th, Allied planes were warming up for takeoff when G.I. Joe came through with a message. The town had been captured and was in British hands. The bombing run was aborted just in time. Joe was officially credited with saving a thousand Allied soldiers' lives. He was presented the distinguished Dickin Medal, the animal equivalent of the Victoria Cross. The amazing abilities of homing pigeons remain a mystery. Scientists believe they possess a solar compass in combination with geomagnetic sensors. They may even use scent to navigate. There's considerable controversy on how pigeons actually home. There's something about the bird that allows them to detect the magnetic fields of the earth. There's obviously other cues they also use. Dave Coslow knows what he's talking about. He's employing pigeons every day in his rafting company, Rocky Mountain Adventures, in Fort Collins, Colorado. As rafters ride down the Cache Lapuda River, Megan Apfel shoots the action for Rocky Mountain Adventures. This gives customers a way to relive their run through the rapids. Now to get the film back for processing in time for the rafters to see their photos. It's 25 miles back to town over twisting mountain roads, and Megan must get set for the next rafters already heading downstream. The answer? Pigeon film couriers. Good bird. Megan loads a roll of film into a stretchy lycra backpack, and the pigeon is up and away. 
Coslo calls it the Pigeon Express, and to carry his cargo, he uses birds specially bred for homing. But even the best required initial coaching. Training flights began at the end of the day, taking advantage of the bird's instinct to roost. Short flights were increased 50 yards at a time as the birds progressed. When they were able to fly faster than we could drive home, we added more mileage until they were flying the distances we want them to quite successfully. As a pigeon returns to the loft, it enters through a gate, setting off an electronic signal. This alerts the staff that film has arrived. The Pigeon Express has been operating for over five years. Some of the company's pigeons are third generation photo couriers. Coslow has lost one bird, dubbed Amelia Earhart, a casualty he fears of hawks. We've done better getting the film back on time with the pigeons than we have with any other method we've considered. And it's also been a more fun approach to trying to get the film back. So gang, we've got the photo machine downstairs, so if you like anything, we can shrink it, we can enlarge it, we can do anything you want to. There's us right there, isn't it? The rafters are duly impressed. There we go. That's us. That's a good one. For the Pigeon Express, business is booming. I think it's fantastic. Yeah, it's by the time you get back here, the pictures are already done. They work for <laughs> they work for Bertsy. <laughs> <laughs> they are in their wings. <laughs> in the communications revolution of the 21st century, not everything is wireless and digital. Out here in what's left of the wild, pigeons still deliver. As evening approaches, a bird stands guard over the sugarcane fields of South Florida. He's been waiting for nightfall when sugarcane poachers begin their work. Rats. Rats devour some $30 million worth of sugarcane each year. It's the barn owl's job to stop them. The faint rustlings are loud and clear to the waiting owl. Its disc-shaped face helps direct sound to its sharp ears. And even in the dark of night, it can see a rat move. It's not much of a contest, for barn owls are members of one of the bird world's most extraordinary families. Unlike other birds, owls are designed for darkness. When most birds have gone to roost, owls are on the prowl. There are more than 130 kinds, and they have colonized every habitat. Their soft, downy feathers and large, appealing faces are merely a disguise. For all owls are predators, swift and silent killers in the night. The skills of owls have mostly gone unnoticed in Belle Glade, Florida. Owls have long been part of this agricultural landscape as traditional on the farm as a barnyard cat. Dr. Richard Raid of the University of Florida explores one of their typical homes. This building that we're in is barn owl heaven. The barn owls have kind of taken up residence here and at any one time you might find three to four nests of nesting barn owls uh, in this particular structure. The dried-out remains of a meal prove his point. 
but unused buildings such as this are becoming harder for barn owls to find. And also some of the urbanization is taking down some of the trees surrounding the agricultural area and so even natural nesting sites are going um, and being built on. To most people here it was good riddance. Not many appreciated what barn owls can do. But Wayne Boynton was different. I noticed a loss of habitat for the native indigenous barn owls, so I thought of a way to try to increase the number of barn owls in our area. I designed and built nesting boxes for them and placed them all over the farm. Like other growers here, Boynton was spending thousands of dollars a year fighting the rat problem with poison. The rats were winning the war. He thought barn owls could help. Checking in on the chicks, Boynton knows that each one of these fluffy little babies will soon be eating 1,500 rats a year. He's the godfather of a reborn rat patrol. Many people doubted whether if we built barn owl nesting boxes that the owls would actually use them. But I have found that as in the movie Field of Dreams, build them and they will come. I have nearly 25 nesting boxes scattered throughout the 3,000 acres of our farm and 100% of them are occupied. Boynton's success is turning things around for barn owls in the sugarcane town of Belle Glade. What do barn owls like to eat? Does anybody oh. know? Yes. Rats, voles, rats, rodents. And, rats, voles, and rodents. That's right. Does anybody know what we call this? Yes. An owl pellet? An owl pellet. That's exactly right. And Richard Raid is directing a fifth grade science project. They're dissecting owl pellets, the regurgitated remains of the owl's prey to see for themselves exactly what owls feast on. Has anybody found any skulls in theirs? Oh, excellent. I see two skulls in the same pellet. These fifth graders are constructing their very own rat skeletons. Six rodents. I mean, I'm not sure what this is. What the heck is this? A hip bone, a pelvic bone, that's right. What Richard Raid is building is a newfound respect for barn owls and the protection they provide to the fields of Belle Glade as they set out to hunt each night. Hey, hi Greg. Bath time, huh? When somebody asks, what do you do? I say, I train birds. And I also tell them that I educate people because really the reason I'm in this business is to educate people about wildlife. My passion, my personal interest is birds. Wait till you see what we have for you. In Lake Wales, Florida, Steve Martin puts his philosophies to the test. Well, the way we train birds is all positive reinforcement. We never make a bird do anything he doesn't want to do. If one of our birds doesn't want to go out and do a show, we don't make them. You should always let birds do things and never force them. Quasar, an African gray parrot, is in training for his first appearance in Steve's show at Disney's Animal Kingdom. The key is in understanding how to keep Quasar interested. We put Quasar in a big cage, we put a tape player there, and the tape just continuously says four. Once he's saying the word four, I'll reinforce it or reward it with a piece of his favorite treat. Come on, guys. Four. Come on, guys. Oh, good job. Four. Good, Quasar. Good. Hey, here, here. Good boy. You're ready to go inside, Quasar. All right. Now, Quasar's been outside listening to the tape for the last couple of weeks. He's actually learned to say the word four. He says it very well, matter of fact. So now the next step is to bring him inside where I'm real close to him. He's just around the corner in the other room. When he says the word for, I'm going to reward him with one of his favorite treats, a sunflower seed. Now I know he's going to say it. He's been talking all morning long. Let me just stand over here real close. 
Listen. Good, Quasar. Good. That a boy. Three. Three. Good. Three. Good. Steve gets a bird's eager participation by understanding its social needs. Parrots love attention and form deep and lasting bonds. Quasar. Good boy. Good boy. Okay. Training is simply another word for communication. And encouragement, Quasar. not discipline, gets the best results. Good, Quasar. Good boy. What a good boy. Steve has spent years observing birds in the wild and has come up with provocative insights into bird psychology. See, parrots in the wild, nothing ever dominates and forces them. There simply is no leader in a flock of parrots. They're all equal. So when you try to dominate him, it's very unnatural. If you want your bird to do something, find a reason that he would want to do it. A very important part of bird behavior is their nonverbal communication. That's how they communicate with each other in the wild. The subtle look of an eye, maybe the, uh, the feathers coming up, up on the back of their head. The problem a lot of people have is they're not, they're not very perceptive of those subtle communications. So we're really not set up well to understand a bird's body language. Three weeks into Quasar's training, it's time for dress rehearsals at Disney's Animal Kingdom. Say hi. Hello. We're just getting them used to being around people. Okay, Quasar. Hello. Here you go. Pretty scary place, Quasar. Okay. Easy. Once we get him to Disney, the first thing is to get him used to the stage. So we'll bring him out on stage, let him desensitize for a little while, and then we might fly him back and forth uh, between two trainers. We'll start working him through the backdrop, getting him used to making his entrance onto the stage. What a good bird. Okay, ready to go back? Come on, Quasar. Come on, Quasar. Quasar. Whoa, good boy. That was great. <laughs> Rebecca, I think he's ready. Let's fly him out a little bit. About okay. 10 feet, okay? Good boy, Quasar. Okay, here you go. Quasar has been learning so quickly, Steve thinks he's ready to go on. In the afternoon show, this little parrot will make his debut. Steve's birds in the Flights of Wonder show always draw a big crowd. Four years old, you know, that's doing really well because 75% of these birds of prey don't make it to see the end of their first year. All the shows we produce use free flight birds demonstrating natural behavior. We don't do any parrots riding bicycles or scooters. We really like to let people see these beautiful creatures doing the things that they would normally do in the wild. And all the behaviors are sort of designed to help people understand a little more about that bird and about the natural world. All right, Quasar. It's time for Quasar's big moment. Now, he normally joins us from this window right over here. All right, just about ready. Okay, just like we practice it. Here we go. Go on. You're what you doing, sweetie? Come on out. Meet everybody. He's a little shy today. Go on, go on. It's okay. Go on. Go on, go on. Good, good boy. Come on, kiddo. <laughs> All the way out here, show everyone your pretty face. Here he comes. Oh, and I see we have a volunteer. Can you say your name into that microphone and tell everyone where you're from? Uh, hi, my name's Nicole, and I'm from Canada. Okay, Nicole, here's what we're going to do. We're just going to have a little math competition between you and Quasar. So all you have to do is say the answers into your microphone before Quasar can say the answers into his. Are you ready for this? Quasar, Nicole, what is one plus three? Four. Four. Whoa, they're both quick this morning. Okay, I think we better move on to division. Well, I'm not good at division. <laughs> well, that's okay. Quasar isn't very good at division either. Here we go. Nicole Quasar, what's 12 divided by 3? Oh. Ah, okay. Well, I think we better do one more question. This one's going to be winner takes all. You ready for this? What's 2 plus 2? 4. Yeah, Nicole wins! Here you go. Here's your sunflower seed. Quasar, of course, is not a mathematician. His job is to say four whenever the trainer says three. And it even works if we say something that kind of sounds like three. Watch this. Quasar, what do you say when you hit your golf ball over a tree? Four. 
Cole, you are a great volunteer. Thank you so much for coming up here. Come on, Quasar. Come on, good, what a good boy. Oh, what a good boy. You were so good. Wow. Birds are birds. They're not little humans. They're intelligent, marvelous creatures that rely on us to understand that we'll never be their master. We, at best, will be their equal. And in the company of equals, it's friendship that matters most. Good kitty. Hi, Lucky. You being a good girl? Hi, Mr. Perot. Here at the Queen of the Rosary Convent in Amityville, New York, Sister Barbara Seward administers to her flock. What a good man. Yes, I love you too. You yeah, do. You're a good boy. This is Francis. Francis is a starling that we adopted because the crows were trying to get him. Yeah, but we wouldn't let that happen, so he's now living with us. This is Peter. Uh, he's my male cockatiel, and Mary, the female. You notice there's a difference in the coloring. Lucky lives up here in this cage. Quakers are very unique kind of birds. They are the only parrots that build nests out of uh, twigs. So I started giving Lucky wooden coffee stirrers, and lo and behold, Lucky's building a nest out of her cage. Sister Barbara has adopted all of these birds. She has 11 finches, two parakeets, a Quaker, four cockatiels, an African gray parrot, at least 22 birds in all. I came to live here because I have some health problems that I can no longer work in a regular job. I'm a registered nurse and I really enjoyed that very much. I felt kind of like useless, like what am I contributing, you know, being kind of semi-retired. And I got the bright idea one day of why couldn't I create a ministry out of my hobby and share my love for the birds and the relationship that the birds can have with us with other people. Recovering here from the neglect of her former life is Angel, the African gray parrot. Though she still plucks out her feathers, Angel has become a special sort of guardian. I don't know what it is. They say parrots pick their friends. Angel likes me and is dependent on me. You know, I have no doubt about that, but Angel just loves Sister Una so much. What a good bird you are. Yeah. Sister Una Marie is being treated for Alzheimer's and struggles with her memory these days. Angel has just reached out to her. It's just remarkable. I guess it was love at first sight, really, because the bird came to me and, well, has been coming ever since. And whenever it sees me, I come into the room. It's ready to come on down if it's in the cage. Come down, come out, get out, and get over to me. Yeah. Yeah. We just love each other. Is that right? Mmm. The convent hosts pet therapy sessions for a neighboring retirement home. Friends of mine offered to come the first time. They come all the time now, and we're called the Feathered Friends. Hello, Tina. You're not going to bite me now, are you? Aww. Oh, you're a lovely bird. Do you want to live with me? <laughs> yes, she said. Yes. We had a choice today whether we would come to a prayer hour by Father Ted Ross or come to see the birds. Everybody has been so excited. The prayer hour can't even hold a candle to the birds. It's so beautiful and so wonderful. Yeah, good boy. I never got so close to a bird in my life. It made me feel very heavenly. I'm up with the angels. Nobody keeps the birds down. You beat them, you fly away. Don't you want to fly away like a bird? <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Did you see underneath here? Lucky has pretty, pretty blue feathers too. Oh my. See? Isn't she pretty? And the flight feathers in the wing. And she just loves to come to people and cuddle. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Just last week we had an experience where a woman was totally unresponsive 
And by the time we left, with just stimulating, with feather touch, and well, her eyes were open and she was smiling. And all the pretty colors. That does more for me than, than anything. There's that, just her response was worth the whole hour there, even if nothing else had come of it. <laughs> Sister Barbara knows the mysterious power birds have to touch something very deep inside us. She and Angel often take Sister Yuna on small outings. Together, Angel and Sister Yuna, at peace in each other's company, are able to enjoy the wider world. I think God's presence and His touch is everywhere in all of His creation. Whatever I can do to help people to experience that, I think, is ministry. I think it brings us all together, and we are, in a sense, all one. Across the world, the time has come for the birds of the monsoon to leave Kundakulam. They have brought their gift of rain to the village, and now they must move on. For people everywhere, birds are a symbol of all things wild and free. But endowed with extraordinary abilities, they are more than simple wonders of the natural world. Here, to the people of Kundakulam, birds are a blessing.